and welcome. You're with us here on The Date. Today we are meeting Samir Modi, scion of the KK Modi Group and MD of Colabar Cosmetics. Samir has always been incredibly passionate about his work, always trying his hand at new ventures and has dreamt only very big. Let's tell you a little bit more about Samir Modi. Samir Modi is the scion of the almost $3 billion KK Modi Group. Apart from playing a strategic role in flagship group companies Godfrey Phillips and Indofil, Samir has always been driven to create new opportunities. His first venture, Modi Care, was a success, which he soon left in professional hands to focus on what he believed was to be the next big idea, Kalaba Cosmetics. With a growth rate of 86%, today Samir is having the last laugh. Along with Kalabar, he is also bullish on his other venture, an aggressive rollout of 24-7 convenience stores over the next few years. For the group, he says, an aggressive thrust on retail is clearly the way ahead. Samir, thank you so much for joining us today. It's so good to meet you again after so many years. And the last time we met, uh, Kalabar had just was still in its nascent stages. It was still growing. It was a new company, and uh, today it's it's grown by leaps and bounds. And before I even get to that, you know, for you, I remember at that time you telling me so many people had said you're getting into makeup. Why are you getting into makeup? What's wrong with you? What is this new business you're getting into? The market was so much more disorganized at that time. That's right. So when you look back today and you look back at your decision, how do you feel? Well, it's been a it's been a tough journey. It has not been an easy journey in the last eight years. There have been many uh, uh, challenges, and there have been many questions by the family: Why are you doing this? When are you going to make money? Uh, but it's been a, a great business to do: to build a brand from scratch, to compete with the big players like Unilever, uh, Revlon, Maybelline, L'Oreal. And even brands like Mac and Bobby Brown, who just come into the country. Right. So it's a, it's been a, it's been a rewarding, uh, rewarding experience, and to just say you can create something. Absolutely. So what was the initial thought when you actually went out there and created Kalabar? What was the thought behind it? How did you come up with the idea? Well, initially, I I used to run a the cosmetic side of my direct selling company, and I enjoyed that creating that segment. So when I professionalized Modi Care and wanted to look at something new, I said, "What business is that exciting and constantly changing?" And I came up with with cosmetics. And then we did a small research whether women are happy with the makeup that they're currently using. And we came through a need where it said Lakme is too old and L18 and streetwear is too young. Right. And there was no slot in between the two. And we said that's a great opportunity. There's nothing for the working woman. At that point, saying that this is my brand, my makeup, yeah. this suits me, uh, and that that I thought was a great opportunity for us to plug in something right there. Right, and you yourself have been very involved in the entire making of uh, or research really behind uh, the products. I mean, you started from as you said a small selection of uh, lipsticks and nail paints, and now it's expanded a lot. So just take us through the kind of evolution the brand has seen over the last few years. Well, originally we targeted a different market. Yeah. We were looking at the lower end or the upper end of the lower end, uh, and the packaging was we were importing packaging and the formulations were okay. They weren't the greatest formulations, and then something changed. Hmm. We said, you know, this is not the market we want to be in. This is not the product I want to sell. This is not the product I want to put my name into. And we said we'll import the best product that is available to us anywhere else in the world. We started looking for product in Italy, Germany, right. Greece, Paris, and we started going to the manufacturers who make for uh, for the top brands, uh, whether it's a Mac or a Bobby Brown or Estee Lauder. Didn't matter. Uh, these are the brands they were manufacturing for and developing product for. And we asked them, "Can you make for us?" Hmm. So init initially there was a lot of hesitation because our volumes are very small, and we were not able to give them the quantities that they wanted. Hmm. But slowly, as we started expanding. Uh, the volume started coming, so that is one change that we did. We bought an imported product into the into the brand, okay. and then we upgraded the packaging completely. We put all our packaging from shrink wrap into cartons, from uh, clear packaging into shiny silver. Uh, we last three years ago opened our own company store in Flex City, 
So we started dabbling and experimenting in in various parts and found that the brand is now getting more acceptability. We were a young brand, we had very small budgets uh, where people were sending, spending crores of rupees, we were sending lakhs of rupees. Uh, but we said we will do a change, we will give beauty advisors in every counter, we educate them, we teach them how to do makeup. And so when the woman comes to the counter, she gets not only advice, but she gets solutions to her problems. I think that was a big change that we brought about that has helped the brand. Uh, in the last few years. So today, a color bar has uh, how many stores are it? Give me an idea of the kind of distribution or expansion it's seen. Well, we have uh, 740 stores across India, which are shop and shops. Right. Uh, in department stores and mom and pop stores. We have 28 of our own company stores, which are in large malls and freestanding uh, locations in, okay. in high streets like Bombay. And we are in Dubai and Abu Dhabi right. and we are looking to venture into uh, Thailand. Okay, so also expanding overseas. That's right. So, you know, in terms of the kind of challenges uh, that you face and as you mentioned, just take us through some of them because retail, I mean, cosmetics is one thing, but on the retail front, this is a tough market. Um, we've had a lot of uh, established players who've been crying out because of the you know, high costs that they've been seeing and then the recent economic scenario as well. So how does a, a young brand withstand that, withstand these tough times? And what are some of the other challenges you faced as well? Well, one challenge has really been deep pockets. You need deep pockets to be in this industry if you really want to grow fast. Yeah. So we didn't have deep pockets, but we had a, we had a great concept in mind. We had a great philosophy in mind that truly helped us. The other challenge has been really the dollar pricing. Because since we import almost 85% of our product uh, from abroad, the dollar pricing makes a big difference and we're not able to pass that price increase uh, to the consumer. So that, that is another challenge, how, how do you manage that? Right. Uh, the third challenge has really been the minimum order quantities that the manufacturers want. We wanted at 1.500, they wanted us to buy 5,000. So, but over the years, in the last few years, we've reached a stage where we say, no, we don't, we don't want 500, but we want 10,000. Okay. So those are challenges we've overcome. So for a consumer as well, how do you define color bar today? What is the USP or how does it stand out uh, as opposed to a Lakme or Revlon? I mean, I, I know you told me what they were looking for, um, but today when, when, I, when a consumer goes into a store and looks for a color bar product, has it achieved that purpose and do they perceive it as a semi-premium product, uh, you know, a lot of color? Well, we've got two kinds of customers. One right. who really don't know us. Okay. And who walk into a store and say, oh, what is this brand? Where is this brand? And I've never used this brand. Right. The second consumer is the consumer who's used us. And they come back because we have a large variety of colors. We have innovation product. Uh, they come back because we are giving solutions for the Indian skin. Right. And they come back because of our color palette. Mm. Our color palette is fairly diverse. Uh, we, for example, we've got 180 shades of nail polish, right. which no other brand in the country has. I mean, somebody will have 50, somebody will have 40, but nobody has 180 shades. And also the experience of the select city or our own stores. Right. The brands like Revlon or, or Lacme or Maybelline or L'Oreal, none of these brands have the company stores, while all the prestige brands have it. So that helps us peg in, in, in the same bracket because they see the same product uh, that they see in the prestige brands that we are selling. The quality is the same, the product is the same, only the name is different. Okay. So it's, it's been a it's been a win-win from that point of view. You know, Samir, you were talking about how there's always been some kind of accountability in terms of the amount of money you are putting into the business. Uh, you know, many people would assume that because there is a family backing in this kind of scenario that you wouldn't have that problem like many other entrepreneurs out there. So what is the kind of accountability that, that you have in a family business? Like, What's to prevent you from, uh, from a far more aggressive expansion and figuring out the profits later? Well, we are in a family system. Yeah. Uh, we are also in a business system. There are other, other CEOs or other businesses in the group. At the same time, every member wants to do something different. So it's not that what I'm doing uh, is sacrosanct to me and my sister wants to do the same thing, but she wants to do her own thing beside the family business. So the, the call is that where the money is limited, 
the call is where do you put the where do you put your eggs right in which basket right and so there's accountability from that point of view second is the business plan once you present the business plan to the family uh you need to achieve it so so there's a proper process it's a proper system. process it's a proper right. process of really uh yeah. quarterly reviews a uh, half yearly review and uh a uh, yearly review and a three year business plan that you need to present okay so initially we have shown we have shown losses but we were also very uh, aware that we can't ask for enormous budgets because nobody's going to give that right so we were running on a shoestring budget okay and now in the la- in last two years we've been started to make money the company is profitable so we're not asking the family any money so that's a great feeling all right let's take a very quick break here on the date we come back and continue our conversation with samir i talk to him a little bit more about his other baby 24/7 the retail stores we come back with that in just a moment we are opening more stores in the last 12 months we've opened almost 20 stores so the expansion is uh, has has been tremendous mm-hmm. 